um, tillage-based management versus cover crop-based no-till. And one of the biggest um, benefits, not only with the weed management aspect, which is huge and organic, the use of this as a weed management tool, but are obviously the benefits in terms of preventing soil erosion. We do farm organically on a lot of hilly ground here in this state, similar to Jeff, so looking at trying to prevent um, the surface movement of water that uh, leads to surface erosion, huge benefit there, as well as infiltration. And I, as I was driving around, especially with our heavy rain events throughout the state this past summer, I mean, this is, um, especially with conventional-based tillage practices, you see this. I mean, the, the, even though we have you know six to eight inches of rain, it's not getting down into the soil profile. It's not being stored into the soil profile. But if we have a living root system there, and that mulch on the soil surface, we're going to have better water infiltration. There's going to be wetter, better water holding throughout the soil profile, and we're going to have that water where we need it when we need it. So not only surface erosion, but infiltration is a huge benefit as well. That said, I do want to say that, especially, I know there's a lot of transitioning organic farm farmers here, a lot of new organic farmers, a lot of incredible farmers in the audience that have done amazing things with cover crop-based practices, um, and looking at how to reduce tillage on their farms and have been amazingly successful in building their soil. So I don't want to take away the value of no-till systems or cover crop intensive systems or um, stress that we shouldn't be moving in that direction ultimately and, and trying to mirror what has been the system um, for centuries in terms of a prairie and pasture-based system. But that said, I do want to emphasize to transitioning farmers um, that have perhaps been doing no-till that, and Jeff mentioned it this morning, not all tillage is created equal. And, and all of this is looking at the tools we have available to create a system. And if there's one takeaway that, that I'd like to see you take away from this conference is to really, when you're farming organically, look at everything as a system and don't look at things on a single year or even two years or three years. Look at how you're managing over the course of a decade and that is respect to your crop rotation, your weed management practices, also your profitability and expenses and what tools and, and inputs you might buy. So look at it as a system and what tools we have available. So this is from the Wisconsin Integrated Cropping Systems Trial at the UW-Madison, and this is looking at soil organic carbon trends. So the Wisconsin Integrated Cropping Systems Trial has been going on for about 30 years now, and it was um, uh, started in 1989 by Dr. Josh Posner, who wanted to look at the long-term impacts, not only with, res with respect to yields and profitability, but soil impacts of our typical cropping systems here in the upper Midwest. So if you look there across the x-axis, the bottom axis, the CC is continuous corn that is intensively managed, so tillage done on, on conventional corn. Um, minimal till corn soybean system, so there is some strip till done here, but overall, best management practices in terms of um, reducing tillage in conventional systems, and uh, organic corn, soybean, wheat. So this typically has tillage, it has cultivation, it has time weeding. Um, and then the last three are forage rotations. So looking at conventionally grown alfalfa, organically grown alfalfa, and a pasture-based system. So this was measuring um, soil carbon over 20 years and how they differed in those systems from a baseline average. So what you're gonna see here and if you know anything about statistics, you know that those letters that are on the top of those dots from each of these data points, so here, here, and here, this is the soil carbon um, from baseline of continuous corn, minimal tilt corn soybean, and organic corn soybean wheat. So baseline would be zero. So if it was at zero, there would be no net carbon loss. If it was above that, there'd be net carbon gain. What you see here, unfortunately, is in all these systems, we have some carbon loss. So we have work to do. We definitely have work to do as organic farmers. We have work to do as conventional farmers. We have work to do as an agricultural community. But I do want to point out that, you know, even after all that tillage, after 20 years, you're not seeing any more carbon loss in these organic systems as you are in conventional. Now, how that differs right at the start of putting tillage on your farm if you're a, a, a conventional no-tiller, there, there may be some, you know, reaching equilibrium. But, but smart tillage, you know, shallow tillage, using the right tools, I just don't want you to be scared of using tillage as a tool. Because with the other aspects of organic, with cover cropping, adding carbon back into the soil, the diversity of root systems there, 
it's a, it's a system where we're looking at creating a carbon equilibrium, and it's not just driven by tillage, and I think that's an important thing to know. But that said, I'm going to tell you how to try to use an organic no-till system, and I do think that's what we should be striving for, but we're not there yet, at least in the upper Midwest. Okay, so the cash crop and cover crop combinations. You know, Jeff talked about veg and corn. Really, in the north central U.S., our best combination is soybean into a winter cereal grain. And Leah's going to show some data in the afternoon in the no-till session, but here um, we're really talking about winter cereal rye still as our best choice versus winter wheat or winter triticale. Works very, very well. We've had you know, over a decade of experience at UW-Madison. I've been increasingly working with farms that have tried this. It's a, it's a pretty reliable system, but it all boils down to um, achieving adequate rye biomass. And there's various agronomic factors that are going to contribute to that, but you, as Jeff said, you know, we're becoming cover crop farmers in this system as much as cash crop farmers, and we have to give as much attention in terms of planting and designing a rotation and a planting date as we would any of our cash crops. I mean, we're, we're watching the, the calendar to see when we're going to put in our corn and soybeans, right? We need to be doing that with the rye and cover crops as well. Um, and that's not to say that this isn't challenging, but again, you need to look at this as a system and how are you going to design your rotation to allow you to do that. Um, corn into hairy vetch, we already talked about this. Um, we talked a little bit last night, why don't we do cereal rye with corn? And I've said this many times, but you know, there's issues not only with the mobilization of nitrogen, uh, hairy vetch, you're going to have more contribution of nitrogen as it being a legume, it has a different C to N ratio. Um, cereal rye inevitably is going to leave you N deficient unless you put some N on that corn crop. Potentially, we could mix rye and vetch together, um, and the, the presence of the rye might help with the overwintering of the vetch. Um, we could potentially supplement with manure or compost. But right now, I, I just, especially in Wisconsin, again, Illinois, Indiana might be a different story, but I, it's, this system just is not adapted. I haven't given up. But we're hoping to try it again, but um, it's, it's just a highly risky system. The other issue with cereal rye, and I think that there may be some models out there that could help us with um, predicting when to plant the corn versus terminate the rye, um, but armyworm is highly attracted to decaying residue. It will come in, it will lay eggs, and um, it's going to be more devastating to a corn and to cereal rye crop than soybeans. So it's from the pest pressure, too, it's just a highly risky system. So how reliably does the system work? So we talked about it, it depending on biomass, but it also depends on weed species, particularly the presence of perennial weeds. And one thing that I say is, you know, this is not a system to create a weedy field, and this is not a system that is even, I hate to say this again, with a group of farmers that are transitioning, but it's gonna be harder for you potentially during the transition. It actually is a system that's easier I think, from my experience and my observation, with a more mature organic system with a highly biologically active soil um, that has um, been um, able to develop a nutrient cycling uh, profile that is going to allow good rye growth. Um, you know, one of the issues that I see is really spindly rye. So even if you're doing it at three bushel an acre, planting at the right time, if you get spindly rye, you're not going to get a good kill. And I, I think that it happens more in transitioning systems. How we can, again, agronomically try to overcome that, I don't have a lot of answers to that. But I, I do think that's an issue. This also is not a good strategy for perennial wheat. So quackgrass, if we've seen you know, this breakdown, quackgrass and thistle does not want to suppress quackgrass and thistle. Does a great job, as Jeff said, just look at the biology of the system does a great job with small seeded annual broadleaf leaves. Super job. Um, you know, we haven't, and I'd be real curious to hear farmer observation out there about this. We haven't seen a lot of giant ragweed in the system. I'm real curious to see how this could be a tool used for giant ragweed. Um, but it, it's perennial weeds or you know, high, high levels of a weed seed bank not going to do well. And it all comes down to having a high cover crop residue level and competitive cash crop. Seeding rate and date, Jeff mentioned this too. You know, we tried four bushel an acre, didn't see a huge benefit, and just had more seed costs. So three bushel an acre is what we um, want. You know, farmers are always trying to convince me, similar to Jeff, they'll ask me, you know, is this going to work? Like, we could try it, but I, I, 
you know, by dialing down to two and a half, two bushels an acre might work, you're going to take a higher risk. So three bushel an acre is generally what I recommend, sounds like what Jeff's recommending. The one thing that we're talking more and more about now as we look at different, you know, sources of rye seed, and, and Leia has some data on this as well, is not only looking at it three bushel an acre, and we go to this more, too, from looking at optimal planting populations of cereal grains as a cash crop, um, but calibrate your drill, know your germ, and potentially also know how many seeds you're putting out there, because rye seed size varies. So you may think you're putting down three bushel an acre depending on the seed size, but you may only be putting down two, two and a half bushel an acre. So um, that's something, too, as we kind of ramp this system up to the next step that we might want to look um, more on. And you need to plant early, and I'll show some photos in a bit, but you absolutely need to plant early. You need to strategize your rotation, and you potentially need to strategize choosing the maturity of your cash crop too. So again, I don't want to get in the mindset, and we get stuck in this mindset too within our, my program. We're going to do corn, and then we're going to do beans, and then we're going to do a cereal grain, because that's what we do. Um, so we try to choose an early maturing variety of corn or chop off that corn for, for silage so we can get that crop off by mid-September, turn right around, get that rye crop in the ground. So I recommend getting it into the ground in Wisconsin by October 1st. But I know Jeff does it after a cereal grain. You know, there's a market for cereal grains, and cereal grains are so critical to getting our organic systems to work, to get those cover crops in that Jeff talked about that were being so essential. Get cereal grains into your rotation, because not only is it going to benefit your ability to do organic no-till, it's going to benefit your, your system overall. The strategies are your rotation, what cash crops you're growing, what cover crops you're growing, what varieties you're growing. So this is an example. I took this... You hear uh, Jeff and I talk about Stephen Mursky, who's quite a personality from the USDA in, in Maryland, but Stephen does some great work. Um, so these are photos that Stephen gave to me. So this is Maryland, but we see very, very similar results here in Wisconsin. So the dates that you see at the top of the photos, those are the planting dates of the crop. So these are all rye, planted at the same seeding rate. And then Stephen took these photos of ground cover on April 1st across rye seeding dates. It is clear as mud in terms of the difference seeding date of rye makes. And you know you can put on a higher seeding rate of rye if you go later, but at some point you're just not going to compensate. Those earlier um, seeding times of rye, you're going to get tillering that is critical to get the biomass that you need. So you absolutely need to get the rye in early. Um, you know, and don't get so set in your head that you're going to make this work from hell or high water because at some point it's not going to work. So you need to kind of shift into a plan B and be flexible with your system. And if, you know, you have a year like we had where there's just no way you were going to get those crops out of the ground um, and we're trying to develop more and more plan Bs, including spring planting of cover crops, they still give you an option of reducing tillage, but you, you, you don't get so set on it that you do it even though you know it's going to be a failure in the long run. Crimping rye, we use the same roller crimper as Jeff does. Um, this is rear mounted. We've gone to front mounted as all possible because like Jeff said, it makes a huge difference to have this be the first in, uh, in, instrument, first um, implement that touches the, the rye. You need to do it in thesis um, for effective control. This was again from the Stephen Mercy's data. Effective control, he's considering 85% and you can see um, as you're looking at crimping it earlier, here's at the boot stage, that you're going to get very ineffective control, but that gets much, much effect, more effective um, if you're at anthesis or even slightly beyond anthesis at the uh, soft dose stage. This is so regular um, as to when you can predict this uh, because it's not just a heat unit issue, it's also a day length issue. So pretty much on the nose. Um, for a rustic rye, we're looking at anthesis at May 28th, and for any other variety of rye, it's around June 4th. Happens like that every year. Depending on the heat units, the biomass may vary, but the, the flowering date is going to be pretty much to the day, even you know, no matter what the year is, because of the, the effective day length. Um, what are the heat units that affect? The, you know, that's something that we're looking at, and Leia's going to be talking about this this afternoon as well. So we're working with the Idea Network and Adam Davis. To, and we put out data loggers on a variety of farms. And I know Stephen, again, Stephen's just a maniac in terms of the amount of work he does, looking at models to better predict how heat units um, and um, time throughout the season impact rye biomass so we can give better predictive tools 
so that if farmers do want to alternatively manage um, by grazing or baling or integrating the rye, that they can make that call earlier versus later, because that's definitely been a challenge in the system. So um, be on the lookout for that. Mm -hmm. Well, we'll talk about, we'll talk about, you can't crimp the rye early, but we'll talk about an alternative strategy and some of the drawbacks, though, again, thinking of it as a system. So I'll give you a little bit of a, um, talk, I'll talk about that in a few slides. So like I said, we've been doing this for about a decade now. We've had some great results. One of the things here I do want to point out, too, is you notice the further we go along, the better our yields are. And there's a learning curve. With anything in organic, there's a learning curve. Um, I don't think this is so much of us transitioning the land. Maybe it is the land's getting more mature because the land now has been organic for a decade. So some of this perhaps may be an advantage of just a more mature organic system. Um, I don't think, I think we're also, if you know Arlington, which is about 20 miles north of here, we're on some of the best soils in the country. It's soils more like um, Iowa than typically in Wisconsin. So beautiful prairie mollusks. So we have the benefit, that, that leg up in terms of our production system and yields. But our yields have gotten better if we know how to do the system better. Um, and you can see here, initially, you know, we had some pretty big yield gaps between our cover crop base no-till at 30 bushel an acre or 47. Now, I've had farmers tell me if I can get a pretty decent weed-free field, I'm happy with 30 bushel an acre. Um, but, you know, as we've gotten better, that yield gap is closed. And sometimes we've had higher yields. Sometimes we have uh, lower yields. Many times, though, in the last several years, these are statistically equivalent. So... They, they may show up as lower. They may not be statistically lower. I know for a farmer, though, it still might make a difference. Um, but here at 2016, again, we were 61 bushel an acre in cover crop based no till, 57 in our tilled beans, you know, right on par in 2017, pretty close in 2018. I would say typically across experiments, we do tend to see a bit of a yield lag. I would say in the, the range of about three bushel an acre, but it, it varies. But overall, very, very competitive yields in the system, and they're only getting better, I think, the, the further we move along in the system. So, so these are very preliminary data that Leia sent me. And I, I, but everyone asked me, like they asked Jeff, you know, what are the numbers? I want to see the numbers to what my profitability is. So we have a no-till um, versus conventional till. Uh, budgets here with no-till on the left and conventional till on the right. The one thing I want to note with the conventional tillage system and one of the dangers, I do want to say, I, I, I'm like breaking my own rule here because I'm looking at this economics in a single year. And in a conventional till system, even if we're in the conventional, I mean traditional organic tillage, traditional organic cultivation, I'm not including cover crop seed in here. And I don't want to do a conventional or a typical organic soybeans without putting some cover crop in, even if it's just a cover crop to protect the soil in the fall. So we need to really look at this better over a system versus a single year. But I'm, I'm giving you a single year just so you have it, so you can see where some of the differences in costs are. So as Jeff mentioned, you know, a lot of the cost is going to come into, and these are numbers that we get in terms of custom rates of doing this, so it takes into account labor and the cost of equipment, but again, from a custom rate perspective. And we look at the different um, impacts of what we've done over the field in terms of time weeding, rotary hoeing, cultivating. Um, these are from numbers from this year where we took an average of 54 bushel an acre versus 57. You can see the costs, and the costs in traditional organic are going to be higher when you use a typical tillage system. You're going to save money in terms of your costs, even with the cover crop seed. Now, where you get the returns being different, so this is per acre. In our traditional um, organic system, we get a net profit of 765 versus 740 in the no-till system. So they're pretty close, but we're, I mean, it's really that, that little yield gap that's making the difference. But again, the other thing that's not accounted for here is the fact that we have no cover crop seed costs here. And I think if we're looking at it as a system, we really should, because we shouldn't be even farming a typical organic tillage without putting some cover crop in there, because it's just smart organic farming. Um, but, you know, very competitive, and like Jeff said, you are gonna save, you're going to save some costs there. So it kind of comes down to how you, how you look at it there. These are some photos of our field. I think these are typical to what you see of Jeff's, that, you know, there's, there's years we go by. This is this July 17th that it's hard to find a weed in the field. And I do not, I swear you could ask Dylan, <laughs> ask Leah, we do not walk these fields and pick weeds. I mean, this is all having enough biomass there um, and, and the cover crop doing the weed suppression. And it's, 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 a, it's a beautiful, beautiful site. Um, these are from last year. 
Um, but I do want to put a failure, too. It doesn't always look beautiful. Most of the time it does, because particularly if we use rye, they're not always looking beautiful. So this is Spooner rye. Again, this is just from the past summer. Um, again, you're kind of hard-pressed here to find a weed in this field. This is triticale. Um, but triticale you see here, and this is what a, a failed no-till attempt looks like. You see a lot of grass there. I think that may be foxtail. Um, but this is you know, not, not the same degree of weed suppression that we want to see. And as well as allelopathy, I truly think allelopathy is playing a role with cereal rye being the, the um, best crop as well. So um, those, are, those are both in 2018. <clears throat> this is at harvest, a beautiful crop. Um, last year we were a little bit challenged with uh, lodging on the crop, but that, that is not necessarily typical. It was an exceptionally wet year. And also we had some big rain wind events on the farm. This is combining. Um, we talked a little bit about this last night, um, conditions in which combining over the mat can be a problem. I don't think we've ever had a problem, though. Um, if anything, combining leads to some nice... Um, clean beans, and the combine just goes right over that mat and doesn't rip it up. Um, you know, we manage the fall residue differently. Sometimes we do um, just kind of a coarse integration just to kind of chop things up and start getting it decomposed. Other times we leave it on the soil surface and don't do anything until the spring. Just kind of varies what timing we have and what the field conditions are. So this is the early planting approach. So there's a question in the audience, can you crimp right early? Do not crimp right early. Never crimp right early. It's going to be a disaster. So don't try to, um, you know, go in on the system and plant right early. Just as an aside, and again, thinking of the mindset shift from conventional to organic, just don't, I, I don't, I just don't try to plant early, honestly. I mean, I've seen so much better weed-free fields planting late that, again, thinking out of a system of what you're gaining Pushing the planting date is not going to help because you have to think the biology of the system and what you're doing with working the ground and where the, and this is where Jeff's photos and thinking of like where, where, what is that difference between May 23rd and that week later, a lot of it is due to when, and, and Carmen Fernholz, if any of you have ta seen Carmen Fernholz talk, and he's been farming organically for 30, 40 years, one of the best, um, similar to Jeff, one of the first people that I heard that really kind of got me in tune with how to farm, farm organically. He did some work with the University of Minnesota on his farm, really trying to look at um, how timing of, of planting and timing of working the field and, um, you know, going back to ecology and biology and looking how that is, is influenced by the timing of weed seed germination. And you know, a, part, a lot of what we're doing is trying to, to, to work with the system, work with the weeds, so that we're not, um, you know, working the ground and creating great conditions for those summer annuals to then germinate. So, you know, if we're pushing it, we're trying to get those beans in. I'm going to get, like, Wisconsin numbers because that's what I know. Trying to put the beans in on May 15th, getting the soil perfect for the beans to come up. Well, there's also seed in the ground of annual broadleaves just waiting to come up, and we've created a perfect condition for those to come up, too. So we're just going to be struggling with the weed management component, creating a perfect condition for weeds, as a perfect condition for the soybeans. So you're better off waiting and, and letting all the neighbors do what they're doing, but waiting. And you're going to see the payoff, and you're going to see the payoff in the long term. So just, I, I, I'll give you the early planting approach, but the more I get into organic, even with working in this, I'm just not convinced that we should have a mindset on early planting in organic. I think we need to get rid of that. But this is a, one of the values, I think, of this approach as well, though, is inorganic. You never want to take on more than you can manage. So the more diversity you can get in terms of your field management, and obviously this is going to vary depending on what your labor force is and the size of your equipment, but you, the more diversity you can get so you're not having to, like with the springs that we've been getting, we might have 36 hours to do a time weeding. If we had to do all our acres within 36 hours, it would be impossible. So some of these are just breaking up the time that you have to do critical operations on your field so you're not pressured in doing everything, every acre within a, a, a one day period. So the early planting approach may just help vary your field operations as much of a reduced risk approach as to getting an advantage of that earlier planting date. So never crimp right early. <laughs> that was a long answer to, to that question. Um, but never crimp right early. But one of the potential ways to get the crop in earlier is doing this early planting approach. So this is planting into standing rye two to three weeks prior to anthesis. So we're not changing the termination date, but we're changing the planting date. So for us, that's right past the boot stage, and I gave those dates 
um, as to anthesis. That's more like clockwork. The boot stage is a little less like clockwork, but we're, we're talking probably around May 15th. Um, as Jeff said, one of the big issues is trying to get the planter set up right. And, and I know farmers are doing this also, but they have to do a two-pass operation anyway and have had success with this because you, ha you can get that planter set up right to cut through the mulch. But sometimes it's easier actually to plant green through the standing rye and then crimp over it because you'll get better seed to soil contact because the planter is not having to go through the mulch. So this potentially is a benefit that way, although there's um, other aspects that kind of counteract that benefit in terms of stand. In this system, though, the soybeans emerge. If we can get the timing right, that anthesis, the beans are approximately at the V1 stage, and then we can crimp or mow over those beans, and the beans do fine. So this is crimping a rustic. So we planted these about two weeks earlier, and we're crimping over the beans. I'm not sure if I'm seeing it. It's quite a, oh, okay. So this is not what you want to do. This is a photo of not, not what to do. You really have to wait until, and this is where the I would hedge my bets on crimping later, um, because again, you can go into the soft dough and you still get good termination. What you don't want to do is crimp so late that you have viable seed there, because that's kind of going to create volunteers and, and uh, Cereal rye doesn't necessarily all germinate within a single year. So it, what definitely one of the risks in the system, particularly if you have a food grade cereal grain, is you can get viable rye seed from regrowth. So again, think of it as a system and what your rotation is and what your risks are. But here you can barely see there is some beans. They're not at the V1, V2 stage. They're at the, um, or the hook stage, cotyledon stage. This is riskier. You will see some damage. So even if the rise at anthesis, don't wait. Wait till you see some true leaves on this because this is a very, very sensitive stage for those soybeans. But this is what we want to see. So this, the soybeans can take the crimping at this stage. And it's scary. And our uh, operators, when we first started doing this at Arlington, said, do you really want us to do this? <laughs> because uh, because we want you to see your decision, but um, they do absolutely fine. And some of the data that I've kind of gotten to help guide this system is um, in Minnesota, but more so than Wisconsin, one of the practices that farmers use are land rollers. So um, they may not be as aggressive as a roller crimper because they may not have the same blades, but um, there's data from Minnesota with land rolling, which helps pack rocks down into the soil so they're not um, caught up in the combine. And you can roll over beans pretty much until the reproductive stage, and they bounce back. Beans are incredibly resilient. So you can crimp over beans at this stage. And I know that there's several people in the room that have done this, um, and they do have success. And Leia's going to talk a lot more about this data this afternoon. Another picture. So we crimp over these beans. They do absolutely fine. You can see the crimp dry. Um, you can see the beans. So this is some of the data. This is some of the earlier data that we had, but this bears out differently depending on the year. So I'm going to show this data, but again, I encourage you if you're really interested in this stuff to um, come see Leia talk about some of our more um, recent data. But this particular year, we did see um, an advantage with respect to planting dates. So, for instance, um, here is a rustic and spooner planted early and crimped later and a rustic and spooner um, crimped and planted on the same day, and we did see uh, a, a yield bump. But this differs pretty um, significantly between years, and, and my best estimation of why this has been is because in the last two years we've done this, so this was about three years ago we did this study, we've had exceptionally cold, wet springs, and um, you know, that seed just seems to sit there and rot in the ground. So any benefit we have with better seed to soil contact is kind of um, lost by the fact we have that seed sitting in suboptimal conditions. So this is where organic becomes more of an art. And I know that you know we never get perfect weather predictions either, but you know if you're considering this technique and you have flexibility and you see that for the next two weeks, it's going to be cold and wet. I might again, um, you know, hedge my bets and actually do later because, like I said, I just am not convinced, and I'd be happy to talk further about this and be challenged on this. That planting early and organic is really going to get you um, the results that you think you're going to get because of that shift in mindset between conventional and organic. Um, the other option that I think some of the farmers and the panel are going to be talked about, and this is a Plan B with respect to. Uh, no tillage, um, that if you can't get your rye in early enough, is spring planted cereal rye. And I, there's farmers here that have done this very successfully. 
Uh, cereal rye, because it's a winter annual, it needs to vernalize in order to transition from the vegetative to reproductive stage. So if you plant it at a time where it's warm, and I'm not sure exactly what the temperature is. I'm estimating around 45 degrees Fahrenheit, but I'm sure that there's work on this. Um, if you plant it late enough, and for us, I'm guessing that's about yeah, after our first fr or last frost date, it's going to stay vegetative, and it's going to act more like a lawn than a cereal grain. So it's not going to act like oat or spring wheat that's going to grow and set a stalk and go into the reproductive stage and set grain. It's just going to be like a lawn. So what we can do in this system is plant the cereal rye in the spring. And again, this is going to vary depending on what your latitude is. And you know, Jack Arisman's in the audience, and I keep picking on Jack when I talk about this because it was his farm that definitely got me aware of this and inspired about it. I think Jack plants late April. We can't plant in Wisconsin until about um, mid-May to make this work, but it, it, is, it, is a, it is an option. So these are some fields that I took. This was one that I took probably about three years ago. So this field, um, the farmer planted the spring seeded cereal rye. I, I think it was about a two weeks earlier than planting the soybeans. Um, but here, so there's spring seeded cereal rye underneath the soybean canopy, but he did no further um, cultivation to this field. And it's not a perfect field, but considering there's been no other weed management to that, um, that, that's absolutely phenomenal. And you can see what happens underneath the canopy. So this is actually the rye. And depending on the amount of moisture in the year, it may not even stay green and vegetative, but typically dies back and forms a mulch under that canopy. So limited risk in terms of staining beans, limited risk in terms of competition, but creates a competition and a mulch that you don't have to do tillage. And this next picture is from a no-brain field at Willie Hughes Farm. I know Willie's, Willie. <laughs> so Willie's um, done this with success last year, and this is on his farm. And, and Willie, I don't know what the details with planting of this are. Okay, all right. So May 7th with the rye at two bushel an acre. Okay. About two and a half bushels of acre rye on May 7th. Soybeans planted on May 14th, and then he's done no other weed management to the field. And this is this is what it looks like. So really good results. And I know Jack and Jack. <laughs> I'm going to pull put you on the spot again. So you you your number you gave was. You can expect it to work about 80% of the time, but 20% of the time things just don't work so well. <laughs> A little high on the, the good or the bad. <laughs> Yeah, so in Illinois, you're doing them at the same time. I, Wisconsin, we just don't, I haven't, I need a niche where I love it when you guys share experiences so we can better learn the trends of how to make this work optimally. So I just don't, and I don't, again, I don't know if that's the slower warming in the, the spring or the fact that in Wisconsin, our lovely Wisconsin weather, we go from like winter to summer now, I swear, and don't have a spring. But, but Paul? And I, Mark Dudlow, I'm going to pick on another person. I know Mark's tried that. Mark, I don't. Okay. Yeah. 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 Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So Mark was saying that he's tried it, and that you can hopefully pick on all these people later if you want more details, but Mark's tried it as a plan B, has had it work, but it is, again, there's just so much we can all learn together about tweaking the system because he's done some shallow tillage of the rye to, before planting, the spring planted rye, but is wondering if there's a way to just put it on top and imagine either broadcasting or running the drill over it um, so that you're kind of supplementing it. But the, the timing is what, because you can't, unfortunately, because what the, the issue is, so I mean, spring seeded or spring weeds can still come through or kind of the earlier weeds, including common ragweed, kind of comes earlier than 
Um, what we see with uh, uh, some of our other problematic weed, like pigweed and lamb's quarters. So common ragweed is one of the challenging ones. Um, but you can't, again, you can't plant this rye too early. So how do we make this work? Because if we're planting, if you see like early on, like my rye stand's crappy in mid-April, if you plant this rye, at least in Wisconsin, in mid-April, you're going to get enough cold that it's going to go to seed and it's just going to be a mess that way. Um, so it's, there's all these different trade-offs we need to figure out in terms of the timing and management. Um, so again, it's, I, I, I get a little nervous when people see these sorts of results and say, oh, I'm going to plant all my acres in this. I, this is still very, we still have a lot to learn about these systems, huge amount of promise, but um, just try to, these are all different techniques to kind of mitigate risk and diversify how your production system is so that, you know, some acres might work better one year, some acres might work better another year, but you're spreading out your risk and your operations across the entire farm. Uh, I'll pick on Willie there. I think this photo is Megan's. <laughs> so Megan's going to be talking on the panel this afternoon. It's another beautiful photo. And Megan um, is amazing in the different research that she does on her farm. So she has more details about the planting date. Megan's in central Wisconsin. So another. But again, as Jack said, I don't, I've shown her all the good pictures. We have to have not had this work. So we're, we're just, uh, we've failed. So I don't want to, I'm showing the good, but I should show the bad as well because this isn't a no-brainer. <laughs> I like your talk. I definitely encourage you to come to the farmer panel. I, I, but sir, no, I, no, I don't want to be too, it's Jack, so, yeah, 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 so I, I'll pick on Jack and Keith, because Jack and Keith are the two farmers I know I've got the most experience. So Jack, you said 80-20 is too optimistic. Maybe. <laughs> yeah. Oh, interesting. First five days are kind of the critical point of, okay. It's hammering rain. Yeah, that's, it's just so much, so many variables. Weather related, yeah, yeah, weather related. Oh, wow, it's planting soybeans to fry in July. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Huh, yeah, that's it. Rye, rye is a little bit more like vetch that kind of has a hard seed and spreads out over. So that's where rye versus triticale, there's some trade offs there. Keith, what are your experiences with uh, failures, percent failures versus percent successes? So 40 acres out of 150 were a failure. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. So rain seems to be a big factor. So I love to hear all these experiences because I think we can get some trends. But, you know, how are you going to predict if there's going to be a heavy rain after the plant? It's just kind of a wild card. <laughs> sure. sure. Okay. Jack tile field. Yes, yeah, so yes tile, no tile. Not pattern tiles, okay. okay. Definitely, and, and one of the trends I've heard from organic farmers 
and this is even too, choosing your field. I mean, so much of it depends on getting the field and the soil in a state where you can get in there and do timely weed management. And if you're on a, a if you have a farm where you have heavy soils and poorly drained fields, you're at a disadvantage. I'm not to say you can't do it, but you have to think of how you're going to do it. Because certainly, if you have well-drained soils, it's it's just going to make the whole system work better. That's not advocating for. I don't know enough about tile to advocate or not advocate for tile, but I, I did. Being able to get out there as quickly as possible, well-drained soils, and we try to do this through, again, cover crops and building our soil and soil organic matter, soil aggregation, but it's, I mean, sometimes you have what you work with, and that's that. So I'm just going to go through my keys to success. Start small. Um, try it. Minimize your risk. Again, I showed my numbers. There's a learning curve. If anything, there's a learning curve, um, and also adapting to your specific environmental conditions on your farm. Choose wisely. Um, Choose fields with appropriate weed pressure. Keith just said, you know, that failure on that, that field may have been that he was going into a field with heavy weed pressure and it should have just been put into alfalfa and kind of remediated. Um, it's, it's really important. This is not going to help um, prevent weeds on high weed, weed seed bait fields and definitely avoid fields with a lot of perennial weeds. Giant ragweed I'm still not sure about. Don't skimp. Get the cover crops in the ground early enough. Get them in the right seeding rate. Become a cover crop farmer because successful weed suppression requires a dense amount of cover crop residue, and, and that's really the linchpin of this whole system. Alter planting strategies for cash crop. Jeff talked about the equipment, but we also bounce, bump up the seeding rate. I do. I, Jeff, what do you use? Yeah, 220. Jeff, I use 225. So. Um, it's important to and be sure to spend time. Get off the tractor. You know, if it takes an hour to, to adjust things, do it because it's going to pay off in the end. Uh, modify the equipment if needed. Jeff gave some suggestions there. Add extra weight can be important. You need to be sure to get both termination and seed in the ground to make this work. Plan ahead. Um, you know, you're, you're planning for the cover crops as much as you are the cash crops. So you need to be planning far in advance of how you're going to make this rotation work and then order your seeds, strategize how you're going to get this um, all done. But be flexible. It, it's just be flexible in terms of the number of acres you put it in, where you put it in. But if it looks less than ideal, be ready with a plan B. And the plan B might just be incorporating that as a green manure, and that's fine. Um, but you just don't get in the mindset of, again, if you're going to do this come hell or high water because you're probably going to regret it. Um, as Jeff said, if it looks bad, it probably is bad. And, and I, I know people call and say, you know, how – how do I know that? Um, I showed some of those photos um, of, of kind of those different planting ranges, but you definitely, you get a sense pretty early um, how that is going to look.